Fully Cooley is a lot of things, but at its core, it's an incredibly personal work, densely interweaving the creative team's experiences and objects of nostalgia into a story that at times defied literal explanation. So, how would you dub something like that? Something that was practically designed to be difficult to decipher even in its original language. <laughs> To understand that, we need to look into how the original Japanese team brought the story to life in the first place. However, Throughout the Blu-ray commentaries, when asked about the inclusion of key elements such as canned drinks, cats, baseball, and bizarre scenarios like homicidal role players and Nostradamus' predictions, series director Kazuya Surumaki pretty much always replied by saying, I like it. Even the changes in visual style simply came from a desire to experiment with production, deliberately applying them to moments that had little meaning on their own. It wasn't just that the show had the creator's fingerprints all over it, their quote, fingerprints were the core of the entire narrative. Hell, forget fingerprints, Tsurumaki's entire hand is in the show, figuratively and literally. So when it came to casting, he mentioned he prioritized the essence of an actor's voice rather than their acting ability. This approach could explain why the main cast is comprised of so many young actors with distinct sounding voices, or theater actors who at the time hadn't worked in anime before, with relatively fewer experienced seiyuu in the entire cast. He admits this was certainly a more selfish approach to the casting process, however, not only was it very much in line with the philosophy he took with the rest of the series' creation, it also led to the actual conception of some characters. <laughs> While Suzuki Matsuo was most likely cast for his live action and theater presence, Mayumi Shintani was cast due to her connection to a previous Gainax show. In the romantic comedy His and Her Circumstances, Shintani's performance stood out to many staff members as unconventional for a petite female character like Tsubasa. However, others, including Tsurumaki, enjoyed it regardless. At the start of Fuli Kuli's production, Haruko's character was not particularly defined, as the only goal at the time was to create a quote, selfish adult woman that many other staff members recognize as being too similar to Misato Katsuragi from Evangelion. In many ways, Haruko wasn't just portrayed by Shintani, she was inspired by her voice. So as the emblem of the show's insanity, her creation speaks to how integrated that element of personal preference was in the fabric of Fuli Kuli's narrative. The dub of Fuli Kuli was only the second one produced by a studio called Syncpoint, the production branch of Digital Manga Incorporated. While a lot of people remember Stephanie Shea as the voice of Mamimi from the show, she was also one of the dub's producers. This might sound weird to say now considering that she's the current voice of Sailor Moon and has been an ADR director on some of the biggest anime films of the past couple of years, but prior to getting into the industry, she really did not like dubs. <laughs> so bad coming from a dub actress right now. This was pre-Cowboy Bebop, right? I thought to myself, Man, I have no idea if I'm a good actor, but those dubs are so terrible, I'm not even sure that I could be better than that. But I think I could be at least as terrible as that. <laughs> In an interview with Chris Niosi, Stephanie pointed out that there were generally two main approaches to dubbing anime before the boom of the internet. You could either try to make a television hit for general audiences by changing things to make the show more synonymous with an American cartoon, or you could try honoring the source material and find success in something like a brick and mortar store, with try often being the operative word. Fully Cooley itself ended up being a perfect fit for Adult Swim's niche experimental brand. But according to Stephanie, they initially weren't trying to make the show fit for any TV platform. She came to sync point from being an anime fan with an informal acting background, 
Both she and Shizuki Yamashita, the translator and other producer, were pushing for this dub to fall into the latter of those two aforementioned categories, not wanting the source material they loved so much to fall victim to Americanization practices. According to the ADR director and adaptive scriptwriter, Mark Handler, Yamashita's initial translation was incredibly detailed, containing extensive notes regarding double meaning or layers. However, something else that helped him was a consistent sense of correspondence with the Japanese side. The dub team received constant feedback regarding their work, including the meaning behind certain references, idioms they didn't understand, or how any changes should be handled. It was elements like this which resulted in a dub that was received warmly by fans as both well-performed, and also as incredibly similar to the Japanese audio in terms of both the script's contents and the sound of the actors. It seemed impossible that anything could have been so perfect. While Stephanie and the rest of the dubbing staff were leaning very far into the vein of honoring the original, there were also a lot of decisions made that you would almost think went against that. For example, in the subversion of Episode 2, Conti visits a Kanbini and reads a swimsuit model magazine called Deluxe Beppen, before coming home to Grandpa complaining that he didn't get the one with Yumiko Shaku's picture. In the dub, Conti goes to a 7-Eleven to read the porn magazine Hustler, only for Grandpa to tell him off for not getting the one with Anna Nicole's picture. I said to get the one with the Anna Nicole centerfold, can't you get anything right? There are many more instances like this. However, the reason references were used in the first place was to invoke a familiarity that the original crew was trying to harken back to. Obviously, the context behind these specifically Japanese objects cannot translate directly to an American audience, but the meaning behind the references could still be maintained, which is why working with the Japanese side so closely was important to find suitable equivalents. The main exceptions to this were references pertaining to anime itself. And when considering that a lot of fans of Fully Cooly would get exposed to the source of those references as anime became more popular over here, an argument could be made that the dub was actually improved for Western anime fans over time. However, this doesn't really change the fact that any alterations could serve to make other script decisions feel a bit questionable. Hey, I'm stuck on this thing. Not only are there instances in the dub where Haruko actually speaks Japanese, but the dub also retains a lot of Japanese linguistic tendencies, including nicknames, onomatopoeia, and most infamously, honorifics. Senpai's phone number! Monchan. Haru-san, you shouldn't do this! Don't you know that- Nowadays, there are rare instances where some of these slip into the dub's common language. However, the consistent use of honorifics in particular can come off as being very out of touch if the actors sound like they have very little context for what they actually mean. <gasps> To some, it will come off as being too rigid to the point of avoiding adaptation, but from another perspective, it can be seen as the dub being used to teach Westerners about Japanese culture. Perhaps questioning why this dub retains Japanese honorifics while using American pop cultural equivalents would be just like questioning why the anime uses manga pages or CG-assisted camera rotation for scenes that weren't really that important. Part of the reason that these elements of Japanese speech were able to sound so natural in the first place is, again, because the actors did have access to the necessary context due to the strong correspondence the team had with the Japanese side. Not only was production IG representative Maki Terashima Furuta present at almost every recording session, but Tsurumaki himself came over to the US for the first three days of the dub's recording to give his own guidance. And indeed, he was pleased to hear that Haruko in the dub sounded almost identical to her Japanese counterpart. Kari Walgren had booked the part with no prior experience in animation voiceover, and no recommendations to back her up. I lucked out! Well, it wasn't just luck. Kari had a background as a singer and also had done some radio work before. The first thing that I booked was a radio commercial for Six Flags, and all I did was scream. According to the series audio engineer Rick Tetzliff, it was because of her singing training that she was able to pick up the rhythms of the flaps relatively quickly, as the director said that it took her only around three minutes to adjust. You are useless! What are you talking about?! It's interesting that Nauta, the directionless kid who doesn't know anything about growing up, was played by the much more experienced Barbara Goodson, who had previously worked with Saban Entertainment. The class president hanging around town like a derelict? Oh, I have such a headache! 
while this alien Mary Poppins was Kari's very first role in her animation voiceover career. In interviews, she mentioned that she really embraced the different visual styles Haruko was drawn in, changing the style of her delivery to accentuate what was on screen at any given time. It's true. You should know about your own head. Primitive monkey! Perhaps the reason why this ended up being so effective is because of the inherent element of visual idiosyncrasy that came with almost every Gainax project at the time. And Tsurumaki himself seemed to acknowledge that this is one of the most distinct elements of anime that separated it from Western animation. The studio had built up a reputation as visual rock stars within the anime industry, so any vocal performance that accentuated these drastic visual changes could be seen as honoring that. It's also evident that the team took care to emulate the inflection of the original Japanese performances for certain reactions. When considering how important vocal essence was to Tsurumaki in the original, it makes sense in the context of the dub. However, the American actors were still incorporating this essence into their own performance and understanding of the characters. When she stings, she leaves a demon's mark that shows you've been doing naughty things and it never goes away! In fact, when it came to the character of Gaku, Tsurumaki was actually more satisfied with Bob Klein's interpretation than he was with the original actor, likely due to the fact that Bob's energy matched the changes in animation better. <laughs> That that satellite was coming down. That you saved the city? That you did it, Naota? Back when Mark Hanlow was first getting into the anime industry, things weren't always as involved. When working on shows like the original Voltron, recording was done using stopwatches for timing with no picture. Writers were handed out individual episode scripts with a little idea of overall continuity, and when clarification was needed, some executives would treat Japan as if it were Mars. All of this led to unsung dialogue, emotionally imprecise performances, and a rather flimsy feeling of narrative force. Of course, the process improved across the years. However, not only was Mark now well accustomed to the technicalities inherent to ADR, but his work in original writing further assisted him in understanding the importance of dramatic structure in anime. When you're writing ADR, the important thing is you have to look at each scene as it comes along and say, how does this scene fit into the story? How does it move the story forward? You have to think it through like a writer would think through an original story. And I think where you get a lot of bad ADR scripts is people who don't understand that and they just translate each line, but they're not asking themselves, what does a scene do it? What needs to come across in the scene to move the story forward? In the booklet that came with the original US DVDs, Mark goes into detail about how he combined his original writing experiences with the insight provided by the creators for things that he didn't understand. A particular overarching theme described was the connection between sexual contact and surreal cataclysmic events. In episode 1 and 2, fighting robots would burst from Naoto's head after he witnessed Mamimi being sexually frustrated. This then comes full circle during the show's climax, when Naoto kissing Haruko becomes the trigger to summon Animisk out of his head, who grabs the giant iron. Even the iron itself, which represents the closest thing the show has to an antagonistic force, Medical Mechanica, also relates to a Japanese idea that the smarter someone is, the more wrinkles they have in their brain. The dub team needed to do the research and ask the necessary questions to decode these elements for the sake of making sure that context would still be appreciated by non-Japanese audiences. But despite those cultural gaps, the understanding of overarching themes such as this would reinforce the adaptive writing. Because this idea of intertwining extraordinary phenomena with ordinary objects is present in almost every aspect of the series. Whether it's a regular clothing iron for universal mind manipulation, killer robots based on mundane objects, a fat cat to channel the words of Haruko's superiors from probably light years away, or even Haruko herself, the sheer extent of the show's strangeness can still be felt in the dub today. As outlined before, some things were emulated while others were changed completely. And while that may seem contradictory or randomly selective, in a lot of ways, that's exactly what Fooly Cooly was. From the ground up, it was a story driven by personal nostalgic impulses, things that would always hold more meaning to the people making the show than it would for the ones watching it, almost like one big in-joke. So adapting that into another language would be synonymous with the dub staff getting in on that joke, right down to trying the same sour drinks that Nauta bookends the first episode with after discovering them at a store down the street. 
I don't think the Fooly Cooly dub matters because it sets a standard that all dubs must retain honorifics, interpret pop culture, and so on. Rather, I think it's important to remember because of how it represents the extreme of that multi-layered approach to adapting anime, showing that creative teams need to find a synergy with the series they're adapting. And that synergy is arguably what leads to dubs that capture the spirit of the original without being bound by it. Dubbing anime isn't just about making things more accessible, or just staying close to what was in the Japanese script. Things like that are in service to something far more complex and valuable, telling the story. It's about embracing the essence of that particular narrative, then wielding it in a completely different language. Despite different titles varying widely in content, that need for synergy will never not be important when it comes to dubbing anime. Even if it's something as messed up, eccentric, and unrestrained as Fooly Cooly. Unlike the dubbing team, the audience doesn't need to understand what went into Fooly Cooly to appreciate it, because Haruko wasn't the only alien entity in this show. All the obscure references that ended up changed or preserved, the shifts in animation style and fourth wall breaks are enough to make your average viewer feel as lost and directionless as Naoto does in this town, surrounded by silly adults who he looks down on. He wants things to remain simple and familiar in a world he doesn't understand, one where nothing really happens and everything is ordinary. But that isn't always synonymous with growing up. Just like how no two human beings are the same, neither are two anime, and by extension, neither should their dubs. Anime with non-Japanese settings may lean towards the sensibilities of that particular country, and not every kind of character benefits from having their seiyu emulated this precisely all the time. But when it comes to Fooly Cooly, the team were thankfully able to do what they needed to in order for the dub to have an affinity with the source. And the fact that said source material was something so fundamentally intertwined with the original creator's thoughts to the point that it barely makes literal sense, cemented it as something that fans would enjoy and admire even to this day. Sync Point as a studio didn't last that long, however. Mark Handler is currently an executive producer at Disney in China, where he continues to bridge cultural gaps, and Stephanie would leave her producer's position to pursue voiceover further. However, she's actually returned to the series all these years later as the ADR director alongside Michael Sinter Nicholas, with Shizuki returning as the translator as well. There's always going to be a lot of uncertainty in the world, and that goes for the world of Fooly Cooly, as well as the world of dubbing anime. After all, both are still ongoing as of writing this. The reason why we have videos on this channel dedicated to specific dubs is because sometimes the story of how they came to be can be interesting journeys all their own. When something is done well, it can look like it's easy. So in some ways, it is fooling the audience the same way that the eccentricity of Fooly Cooly catches its viewers off guard. Just as all that seemingly superficial nonsense served a very personal coming-of-age story that we could all relate to, the process behind what goes into adapting a work of art can show more passion for the material than a lot of people might have initially believed. And to quote Tsurumaki one last time, it's better to fool other people than it is to fool yourself. Hope you enjoyed the video, guys. There was actually a lot more information we wanted to cram into this one, but in the spirit of Fooly Cooly, we wanted to keep things on the briefer side. Make sure to check out all the interviews listed in the description for more information on the fine folks who made the original dub. And, if you want to know more about the show itself, a lot of cool facts regarding the show's production can actually be found in the director's commentary track on the Western Home release, so definitely buy that if you want to see it. Yeah, that's right, buying anime DVDs in 2018. What a concept. If you like what we do here and are interested in supporting the channel, please consider visiting our Patreon. Even a little support can go a long way. Thank you all so much for watching, and until next time.